at part two of redemption, Zarathustra said. And even you have often asked yourselves, who is Zarathustra to us? What shall we call him? And, like me, you answer your own questions with questions. Is he a promiser? Or a fulfiller? A conqueror? Or an inheritor? A harvest? Or a plowshare? A physician? Or a convalescent? Is he a poet? Or a genuine man? A liberator? Or a subduer? A good man? Or an evil man? Nietzsche replied to himself, I walk among men, as among fragments of the future, of that future which I scan. And it is all my art and aim, to compose into one and bring together what is fragment and riddle and dreadful chance. Zarathustra said, A seer, a willier, a creator, a future itself, and a bridge to the future. And alas, also like a cripple upon this bridge. Zarathustra is all this. The Stillest Tower Nietzsche used many words, such as silence and stillness, and thus spoke Zarathustra. However, those words were used in a special meaning. The expression was delicately different from those meanings each and resembled closely. Nietzsche wrote an ex-homo about his situation when he finished writing, thus spoke Zarathustra. There is something I call the rancor of what is great. Everything great. A work. A deed. Is no sooner accomplished than it turns against the man who did it. By doing it, he has become weak. He no longer endures his deed. He can no longer face it. Something one was never permitted to will lies behind one, something in which the knot in the destiny of humanity is tied. And now one labors under it. It almost crushed one. The rancor of what is great. Then there is the gruesome silence one hears all around one. Gruesome silence. At the Stillest Tower. The last chapter of part two. It was one of the most beautiful part in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Nietzsche wrote, What has happened to me? Who has ordered this? Alas, my mistress will have it so. So she told me. Have I ever told you her name? Yesterday towards evening, my stillest hour spoke to me. That is the name of my terrible mistress. I tell you this in a parable. Yesterday, at the stillest hour, the ground seemed to give way. My dream began. The hand moved. The clock of my life held its breath. I had never heard such stillness about me, so that my heart was terrified. Then, voicelessly, something said to me, You know, Zarathustra? But you do not speak. And I answered at last defiantly, Yes, I know, but I will not speak. Then again something said to me voicelessly, You will not, Zarathustra? Is this true? Do not hide yourself in your defiance. And I wept and trembled like a child, and said, Alas, I want to, but how can I? Release me from this alone. It is beyond my strength. Zarathustra crying. It is a rare scene. In addition, after all, voicelessly may be a kind of silence, too. Zarathustra answered to something, and I answered, My words have as yet moved no mountains, and what I have spoken has not reached men. Indeed, 
I went to men, but I have not attained them. Then something said to me voicelessly, How do you know that? The dew falls upon the grass, when the night is at its most silent. And I answered, They mocked me when I found and walked my own way, and in truth my feet trembled then. Then again something said to me voicelessly, Of what consequence is their mockery? You are one, who hasn't learned how to obey. Now you shall command. And I answered, I lack the lion's voice for command. Then again something said to me, as in a whisper, It is the stillest words which bring the storm. Thoughts that come on doves feet guide the world. Here, Nietzsche used some words to be similar to stillness again. When the night is at its most silent, something said to me as in a whisper. It is the stillest words which bring the storm. Thoughts that come on doves feet guide the world. Fire dog and the stillest tower. This the stillest hour has the first appearance in of great events of same part too. Please be careful about his difficult metaphor. The capability to read and comprehend the double meaning is required. At part two of great events, Nietzsche wrote, The earth, he said, has a skin, and this skin has diseases. One of these diseases, for example, is called man, and another of these diseases is called the fire dog. It was ironical message that a human being was a disease of the skin of the earth. Nietzsche wrote, Now I know all about the fire dog, and also about all the revolutionary and subversive devils which not only old women fear. Nietzsche wrote, The world revolves not around the inventors of new noises, but around the inventors of new values. It revolves inaudibly. Fire dog, revolutionary and subversive devils, an infernal racket, were placed on the opposite position of our stillest towers, here. Fire dog, revolutionary and subversive devils, an infernal racket, which he said were war, rightly. Zarathustra said, and believe me, friend infernal racket, the greatest events they are not our noises but our stillest towers. That is, fire dog expresses war, and stillest hour expressed anti-war. Revolutionary and subversive devil expresses war. Nietzsche did not write it as war directly, but used here the word revolutionary. That will be because this continues with, the world revolves. It revolves inaudibly. Possibly he rhymed. In addition, this inaudibly may also be a kind of silence. Nietzsche dislikes these revolutionary and subversive devils, the fire dog. He appealed for the war solving nothing. In addition, at here, Nietzsche wrote Infernal Racket as friend. However, the meaning was enemy. Nietzsche often wrote it in this way in amusement. Nietzsche was always severe. Then he was sometimes considered to be a war lover. However, facts completely differed. He disliked war. Forest and Stillness Nietzsche wrote about special silence also in part 1 Zarathustra's prologue. Nietzsche wrote, but at length he opened his eyes. In surprise Zarathustra gazed into the forest and the stillness. In surprise he gazed into himself. Then he arose quickly, like a seafarer who suddenly see land, and rejoiced, for he beheld a new truth. 
in Nietzsche, the forest and the stillness, was the word which pointed out the special state of its own inside. This part's expression resembled the time of Nietzsche encountering the thought of Thus Spoke Zarathustra on February 3, 1883. Nietzsche wrote that this thought overtook him, who was tired of getting sick on that day. A kind of intense revelation attacked him. He wrote, It was pen on a sheet with the notation underneath. 6,000 feet beyond man and time. Nietzsche wrote it in Ex Homo, 1908, in this way. That day I was walking through the woods along the lake of Silplana, at a powerful pyramidal rock not far from Surlai. I stopped. It was then that this idea came to me. My health could have been better. The winter was cold and excessively rainy. My small hotel, situated right at the sea, so that the high sea made it impossible to sleep at night, was in just about every way the opposite of what one might wish for. In spite of this, and almost in order to prove my proposition, that everything decisive comes into being in spite of. It was that winter and under these unfavorable circumstances that my Zarathustra came into being. Mornings. I would walk in a southerly direction on the splendid road to Zargli, going up past pines with a magnificent view the sea. In the afternoon, whenever my health permitted it, I walked around the whole bay from Santa Margarita all the way to Portofino. It was on these two walks that the whole of Zarathustra Part I occurred to me, and especially Zarathustra himself as a type. Rather, he overtook me. Nietzsche wrote the silence which appears suddenly when he was suffered and he questioned himself severely. This was also called enlightenment and spiritual enlightenment by Buddhism. Nietzsche wrote about these special silences repeatedly. Probably, he wanted to tell these silences. However, many people were not able to understand it, because this was a special experience. Therefore, he, Nietzsche wrote to the side of the theme. A book for everyone and no one. Nietzsche wrote, And believe me, friend infernal racket, the greatest events they are not our noisiest but our stillest towers. Then again something said to me as in a whisper, It is the stillest words which bring the storm. Thoughts that come on dove's feet guide the world. This was Nietzsche's voice. Nietzsche's Down Going Now, I will return to the chapter of Stillest Tower. It was last part of Part 2. Nietzsche wrote, then again something said to me voicelessly. Of what consequence are you, Zarathustra? Speak your teaching and break. Speak your teaching and break. What meaning was this? It was linearly connected with the words, shown in the Zarathustra's prologue. These will be what Nietzsche wanted to write. Part 1 Zarathustra's Prologue Nietzsche wrote, I love those who do not know how to live except their lives be a downgoing, for they are those who are going across. I love the great despisers, for they are the great venerators and arrows of longing for the other bank. 
I love him, who lives for knowledge and who wants knowledge, that one day the Superman may live. And thus he wills his own downfall. I love him, who loves his virtue, for virtue is will to downfall, and an arrow of longing. I love him, who makes a predilection and a fate of his virtue. Thus for his virtue's sake, he will live, or not live. I love him, who justifies the men of the future, and redeems the men of the past. For he wants to perish by the men of the present. I love all those who are like heavy drops falling singly from the dark cloud that hangs over mankind. They prophesy the coming of the lightning, and as prophets they perish. Behold. I am a prophet of the lightning and a heavy drop from the cloud, but this lightning is called Superman. The text which begins from I love was arranged in here 18. The nuance of the self-sacrifice had followed on all. They were heavy drops falling singly from the dark cloud. And as prophets, they must perish. It may be hard to understand these words. However, which is Arthur described here, break, and down going, suggested the fate of Jesus Christ. In part 3, Nietzsche compared these to the Lamb of the Sacrifice. At part 3 of Old and New Law Tables, Nietzsche wrote, O oh my brothers, he who is a firstborn is always sacrificed. Now we are firstborn. But our kind will have it thus. And I love those who do not wish to preserve themselves. I love with my whole love those who go down and perish. For they are going beyond. Theme of Thus Spoke Zarathustra I think that the true themes of thus spoke Zarathustra were creation of new value and a challenge repeated forever. Furthermore, I think that they were the self-sacrifice for it and the prophecy for a new era. They are obstinately described from the beginning of thus spoke Zarathustra. Nietzsche wrote about the self-sacrifice and thus spoke Zarathustra repeatedly and those portions are too beautiful and dangerous. Therefore, Isarathustra Nietzsche himself wrote like this, at part 3. Nietzsche wrote, And recently a woman pulled back her child when it was coming towards me. Take the children away, she cried. Such high scorched children's souls. Such high scorched children's souls. His eye and words were very dangerous to young children. I can also be convinced to it. Nietzsche compared to the sun setting. That people go down and perish. Nietzsche wrote at the Zarathustra's prologue. To that end, I must descend into the depths, as you do at evening, when you go behind the sea, and bring light to the underworld too superabundant star. Like you, I must go down as men, to whom I want to descend, call it. R3. The Wanderer. The theme of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This was a book on the theme of downgoing. However, downgoing which he says here, was the same meaning as redemption. The word, this downgoing, appeared in both part two last chapter and part three's first chapter. I know my fate, he said at last with sadness. Well then, I am ready. My last solitude has just begun. Ah, this sorrowful, 
black sea beneath me. Ah, this brooding reluctance. Ah, destiny and sea. Now I have to go down to you. I stand before my highest mountain and my longest wandering. Therefore I must first descend deeper than I have ever descended. Deeper into pain than I have ever descended. Down to its blackest stream. So my destiny will have it. Well then. I am ready. This book aimed at the new departure. Part 3 of old and new law tables. Nietzsche wrote, Here I sit and wait, old shattered law tables around me, and also new, half-written law tables. When will my hour come? The hour of my down-going, my descent, for I want to go to men, once more, he wrote. Meanwhile I talk to myself, as one who has plenty of time. No one tells me anything new, so I tell myself to myself. When I visited men, I found them sitting upon an old self-conceit. Each one thought he had long since known what was good and evil for man. There it was too, that I picked up the word, Superman, and that man is something that must be overcome. That man is a bridge and not a goal, counting himself happy for his noontides and evenings, as a way to new dawns. Zarathustra's saying of the great noontide, and whatever else I have hung up over men, like a purple evening after a glow. Furthermore, he said, Now I await my redemption, that I may go to them. For the last time. For I want to go to man once more, I want to go under among them. I want to give them, dying, my richest gift. Like the sun, Zarathustra also wants to go down. Now he sits here, and waits, old shattered law tables around him, and also new law tables half written. At part three, the convalescent. Here, Zarathustra told about eternal recurrences, and he talked further like this. I spoke my teaching. I broke upon my teaching. Thus my eternal fate will have it. As prophet do I perish. Now the hour has come, when he who is going down shall bless himself. Thus ends Zarathustra's down-going. Nietzsche described like this is strangely similar with the man who failed in tightrope walking and died, at part one Zarathustra's prologue. Nietzsche made this man's death a kind of symbol. And this resembled fate of Jesus Christ a little. Part 3. The Homecoming there was a strange chapter in part three. The title was The Homecoming. Here, Solitude of Zarathustra talked to Zarathustra himself. O oh, Solitude! Solitude, my home! I have lived too long wildly, in wild strange lands, to come home to you, without tears. O oh, Solitude! Solitude, my home! How blissfully and tenderly does your voice speak to me. We do not question one another, we do not complain to one another, we go openly together through open doors. And at here, some highlights of thus spoke Zarathustra are talked about and are generalized. Solitude talked to him. Do you remember, O Zarathustra, when once your bird cried above you? As you stood in the forest undecided, ignorant where to go, beside a corpse. And do you remember, O Zarathustra, when your stillest hour came, and tore you forth from yourself, when it said in an evil whisper, speak and break, when it made you repent of all your waiting, 
and silence and discouraged your humble courage, that was loneliness. Oh humankind, you strange thing, you noise in dark streets, now again you lie behind me, my greatest danger lies behind me, my greatest danger always lay in indulgence and suffer ants, and all humankind wants to be indulged and suffered. In the last of part four, the words indulgence and suffer ants, these were expressed in other words with pity. And this became the foreshadowing of the scene that Zarathustra went ahead. The Omen and the Sign And Zarathustra said, at part three, of old and new law tables. For that, I now wait for first the sign, that it is my hour must come to me, namely, the laughing lion, with a flock of doves. And the sign appeared. It was the last chapter of part four. Named the sign. Here the laughing lion, with a flock of dove appeared before him. Here, he asked himself the last question. To my ultimate sin? cried Zarathustra and laughed angrily at his own words. What has been reserved for me is my ultimate sin. And once more Zarathustra became absorbed in himself and sat himself again on the great stone and meditated. Suddenly, he lipped up. Pity. Pity for the higher man. He cried out, and his countenance was transformed into brass. Very well. That has had its time. My suffering and my pity, what of them? For do I aspire after happiness? I aspire after my work. Very well. The lion has come, my children are near, Zarathustra has become ripe, my hour has come. This is my morning, my day begins, rise up now, rise up, great noontide. Thus spoke Zarathustra and left his cave glowing and strong, like a morning sun emerging from behind dark mountains. Thus spoke Zarathustra was a book of a self-sacrifice and self-draining, contrary to a challenger's jingoistic words. At Part 1 Of the Way of the Creator Nietzsche wrote, Go apart and be alone with your love, and your creating, my brother and justice will be slow to limp after you. Go apart and be alone with my tears, my brother. I love him who wants to create beyond himself, and thus perishes. Nietzsche wrote, And believe me, friend infernal racket, the greatest events they are not our noisiest but our stillest towers. The world revolves, not around the inventors of new noises, but around the inventors of new values. It revolves inaudibly. Then again something said to me as in a whisper. It is the stillest words which bring the storm. Thoughts that come on Duff's feet guide the world. Nietzsche's Eternal Recurrence Theory Generally, it has been supposed that eternal recurrence was a main theme of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. However, I think that it is not right. Eternal recurrence was a theme of only some chapters of Part 3. Thus Spoke Zarathustra consisted of four parts. Part 1 and Part 2 were published in 1883. Part 3 was published in 1884. Part 4 was printed by self-publication of only 40 copies in 1885. There were 81 chapters in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. However, it was only four that was related to eternal recurrence theory directly.
although two chapters near the end of part two and the chapter of the beginning of part three were related, these were still stages of an omen. One chapter in part three explained the eternal recurrence theory clearly. Stillness and new thought. We already know, when Nietzsche and Zarathustra arrived a new thought and an idea. Always was silence or stillness there. He, Nietzsche always wrote so. However, the state when this new theory came, differed from before. Here, Zarathustra was always troubled by dreams and carried out strange action which was not in former. At part two, the prophet, Zarathustra struggled, and was in pain for three days. Furthermore, he was troubled with a dream, which he could not understand. At part two, of redemption, he was severely astonished at the conclusion, what he resulted. In second chapter of part three, of the vision and the riddle, he told a fearful anecdote. Part 3 in the convalescent, he discovered new thought and had jumped up like the person mad from the bed. Furthermore, after he accepted this thought, for seven days, he struggled violently and was in pain. In these chapters, they were only the scenes that he continued being in pain. Part 2 At Part 2 The Prophet he encountered one big problem in the portion in the end of Part 2. Zarathustra conversed with the Prophet by the Prophet. Nietzsche wrote, A teaching went forth, a belief ran beside it. Everything is empty, everything is one, everything is past. And from every hill resounded. Everything is empty, everything is one, everything is past. The prophet said. Alas, where is there still a sea in which one could drown? Thus our lament resounds across shallow swamps. Truly, we have grown too weary even to die. Now we are still awake and we live on in sepultures. Nietzsche wrote, Thus did Zarathustra hear a prophet speak, and his prophecy went to Zarathustra's heart and transformed him. He went about sad and weary, and he became like those of whom the prophet had spoken. This portion is difficult and needs to be interpreted. Prophet said, Where is there still a sea in which one could drown? This meant that the sun could not set, that a person could not be sacrificed by oneself. In a metaphor of Nietzsche, the sun had to be able to down going. So that the sun falls, the person became heavy drops, and they prophesy the coming of the lightning, and as prophets they perish. However, the chain of the metaphor becomes poor, when the sun cannot down going. The lightning is not announced, and the supermoon does not appear. For three days. Nietzsche wrote. Zarathustra went about grieving thus in his heart. And for three days he took no food or drink, had no rest and forgot speech. At length it happened that he fell into a deep sleep. Then he had a dream that he could not understand. Nietzsche wrote, And this is the discourse that Zarathustra spoke when he awoke. His voice, however, came to his disciples as if from a great distance. Zarathustra said, Listen to the dream which I dreamed, friends, and help me to read its meaning. Zarathustra was tormented by the mystery of one's dream. He was not able to solve a mystery. 
his disciple translated a mystery before long. Zarathustra said, Well now, this has had its time, but see to it, my disciples, that we have a good meal, and quickly. Thus I mean to do penance for bad dreams. Then, however, he gazed long into the face of the disciple, who had interpreted the dream, and shook his head. Zarathustra, Nietzsche, faced a new question here. It seemed to be settled. However, he did not satisfy the interpretation of the disciple. Part 2 of Redemption The following chapter was Part 2 of Redemption. Zarathustra discovered the concrete problem here. Zarathustra said, The will cannot while backwards that it cannot break time and time's desire that is the will's most lonely affliction. It is sullenly wrathful, that time does not run back. That which was, that is what the stone which it cannot roll away is called. Zarathustra asked to himself, The will, that is the will to power, must will something higher than any reconciliation, but how shall that happen? Who has taught it to will backwards too? Nietzsche wrote. But at this point of his discourse, Zarathustra suddenly broke off and looked exactly like a man seized by extremist terror. With terrified eyes he gazed upon his disciples, his eyes transpierced their thoughts and their reservations as if with arrows. But after a short time he laughed again and said in a soothed voice, It is difficult to live among men because keeping silent is so difficult. Especially for a babbler. In part 2, Nietzsche Zarathustra encountered the big wall which he cannot overcome. It made Zarathustra wander about for three days and became a dream which he cannot interpret and that the will cannot change the past, astonished Zarathustra severely. Zarathustra was still confused, and part two finished, with a mystery left. Part three Part three of the vision and the riddle at part three of the vision and the riddle, he found a key to solution. Here Zarathustra speak to Dwarf. Nietzsche wrote, Behold this moment. I went on. From this gateway. Moment the long, eternal lane runs back, and eternity lies behind us. Must not all things that can run have already run along this lane? Must not all things that can happen have already happened, been done, run past? And if all things have been here, before, what do you think of this moment, dwarf? Must not this gateway too, have been here before? It was thought, that such words to dwarf became a prototype of eternal recurrence theory. A new anecdote Nietzsche showed a new anecdote in the second half of this chapter. He discovered people near the dog barking. Zarathustra said, I saw a young shepherd writhing, choking, convulsed, his face distorted, and a heavy, black snake was hanging out of his mouth. Had I ever seen so much disgust and pallid horror on a face? Had he, perhaps, been asleep? Then the snake had crawled into his throat and there it had bitten itself fast. My hands dug and tugged at the snake in vain. They could not tug the snake out of the shepherd's throat. 
Then a voice cried from me, Bite. Bite its head off. Bite. The shepherd, however, bit as Mike Rye had advised him, he bit with a good bite. He spat far away the snake's head, and sprang up. No longer a shepherd, no longer a man, a transformed being, surrounded with light, laughing. Never yet on earth had any man laughed as he laughed. This anecdote has been arranged after describing the prototype of eternal recurrence theory. However, this did not explain eternal recurrence theory. This anecdote showed that man became a superman when he exceeded pains. It was the same position as Zarathustra's prologue. In addition, this anecdote was again introduced in the chapter The Convalescent, at the last part of Part 3. However, here the person bit by the snake was not Shepherd, but the Zarathustra himself. Part 3. The Convalescent The Convalescent. It suited in the end of Part 3. Here Zarathustra became the moment of pain again. Nietzsche wrote, One morning, not long after his return to the cave, Zarathustra sprang up from his bed like a madman, cried with a terrible voice, and behaved as if someone else were lying on the bed and would not rise from it. Surprising personification was performed here. One more person. What was sleeping on the bed, and what he tried to wake, were his thought. This appearance of thought completely differed from former. Zarathustra said, Up, Abismal thought, up, from my depths. I am your cockerel and dawn, sleepy worm. Up, up, my voice shall soon crow you awake. Someone else, who was sleeping on the bed was his abysmal thought, and it expressed as linworm, a kind of dragon, and these all were eternal recurrence theory. Zarathustra said, I, Zarathustra, the advocate of life, the advocate of suffering, the advocate of the circle, I call you, my most abysmal thought. Ah, come here. Give me your hand. Ha! Don't. Ha! Ha! Disgust! 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 Woe is me! Hardly had Zarathustra spoken these words, however, when he fell down like a dead man and remained like a dead man for a long time. But when he again came to himself, he was pale and trembling and remained lying down and for a long time, would neither eat nor drink. This condition lasted seven days. For seven days. For seven days. He was reconstructed between these seven days. At last, after seven days, Zarathustra raised himself in his bed, took a rosy apple in his hand, smelt it, and found its odor pleasant. Then his animals thought, the time had come, to speak with him. His animals said, O oh, Zarathustra, they said, now you have lain like that seven days. With heavy eyes, will you not now get to your feet again? Step out of your cave, the world awaits you like a garden. His animals said, Has perhaps a new knowledge come to you, a bitter, oppressive knowledge? You have lain like leaven dough. Your soul has risen and overflowed its brim. Here. He was likened to breed dough. Zarathustra said, O oh, you buffoons and barrel organs, 
answered Zarathustra and smiled again. How well you know, what had to be fulfilled in seven days. And how that monster crept into my throat and choked me. But I bit its head off and spat away. And Zarathustra said, The great disgust at man. It choked me and had crept into my throat. And what the prophet prophesied, it is all one, nothing is worthwhile, knowledge chokes. At part three, of the vision and the riddle. The monster crept into his throat and choked him. Shepherd, Zarathustra, was a symbol of then the great disgust at man. What is the big weariness, to this human being? Zarathustra explained it here. Zarathustra said, Alas, man recurs eternally. The little man recurs eternally. I had seen them both naked, the greatest man and the smallest man, all too similar to one another, even the greatest, all too human. The greatest all too small. That was my disgust at man. And eternal recurrence even for the smallest. That was my disgust at all existence. Ah, disgust. 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 Thus spoke Zarathustra and sighed and shuddered. Speak no further. His animals answered once more. Rather first prepare yourself a liar. Convalescent, a new liar. For behold, O Zarathustra, new lyres are needed for your new songs. Sing and bubble over, O Zarathustra, heal your soul with new songs, so that you may bear your great destiny. That was never yet the destiny of any man. The new song, which they said here, was eternal recurrence theory. An animal said, For your animals well know, O Zarathustra, who you are, and must become. Behold, you are the teacher of the eternal recurrence. That is now your destiny. However, here animals explained new theory, instead of Zarathustra. His animals said, Behold, we know what you teach that all things recur eternally, and we ourselves with them, and that we have already existed an infinite number of times, before and all things with us. I shall return, with this sun, with this earth, with this eagle, with this serpent, not to a new life, or a better life, or a similar life. I shall return eternally to this identical and self-same life, in the greatest things and in the smallest, to teach once more, the eternal recurrence, of all things. To speak once more, the teaching of the great noontide of earth and man, to tell man of the supermen once more. I spoke my teaching, I broke upon my teaching, thus my eternal fate will have it, as prophet, do I perish? Now the hour has come, when he who is going down shall bless himself. Thus ends Zarathustra's down going. When the animals had spoken these words, they fell silent and expected that Zarathustra would say something to them, but Zarathustra did not hear that they were silent. On the contrary, he lay still would doze eyes like a sleeper, although he was not asleep, for he was conversing with his soul. The serpent and the eagle, however, when they found him thus silent, respected the great stillness around him, and discreetly withdrew. Thus Nietzsche wrote. Eternal recurrence theory was not told by Zarathustra. Surprisingly, it was told by his animals. They described it completely.
for the first time. At this time, Zarathustra showed neither support nor the contrary to this theory. Zarathustra did not answer and became silent. And, the stillness of the new type was used here. Eternal recurrence theory was the one step that Nietzsche tried to step forward newly. Nietzsche has compared down going to the sun setting in a horizon. Therefore, the fate of eternity may not be greatly wrong in it. However, Nietzsche parted from this new thought little by little. Probably eternal recurrence theory and Superman's theory were difficult to be compatible. Eternal recurrence theory was very close to a prophet's words. Everything is empty, everything is one, everything is past. I consider. For Superman theory, eternal recurrence theory was the wrong by road. He noticed soon where the point of the way would be connected. And he began to draw back carefully. There were 81 chapters in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, but it was only several chapters of Part 3, to give the eternal recurrence theory clearly. And the main constituent of Part 3 was of old and new law tables. This chapter was divided into 30 gnarl. This was extremely rare. Of old and new law tables was arranged just before the convalescent. Let's see last part of this chapter. Zarathustra said that I may one day be reedy and ripe in the grey noontide. Reedy and ripe like glowing ore like cloud heavy with lightning, and like swelling mill cutter, ready for myself and my most secret will, a bow eager for its arrow, an arrow eager for its star, a star, ready and ripe in its noontide, glowing, transpierced, blissful through annihilating sun arrows. A sun itself and an inexorable sun will, ready for annihilation in victory. Oh will, my essential, my necessity, dispeller of need, spare me for one great victory. Thus spoke Zarathustra. These were words of the challengers who did not mind self-sacrifice. Is our Part 4 At part 4, their eternal recurrence theory hardly came up other than some words. And the theme called downgoing and redemption which began in part 1 did not change at all in part 4 either. Downgoing and redemption were directly associated to his hour. He was waiting long for his hour. And at part 3, he announced that his hour comes someday. Nietzsche wrote, There I sit and wait, old shattered law tables around me, and also new, half-written law tables. When will my hour come? The hour of my downgoing, my descent, for I want to go to men once more. For that I now wait for first the sign, that it is my hour must come to me. Namely, the laughing lion with the flock of doves. The sign was the last chapter of the part four. Here, Zarathustra greeted his hour. Because the sign appeared here. Here, the laughing lion, with the flock of doves, appeared in front of him. Nietzsche wrote, he suddenly heard that he was surrounded by countless birds, swarming and fluttering the whirring of so many wings and the throng about his head, however, were so great that he shut his eyes. And truly, 
It was as if a cloud had fallen upon him, a cloud of arrows discharged over a new enemy. And behold, in this case it was a cloud of love, and over a new friend. What is happening to me? thought Zarathustra, in his astonished heart, and slowly lowered himself onto the great stone that lay beside the exit of his cave. But, as he was clutching about, above and underneath himself, warding off the tender birds, behold, then something even stranger occurred. For in doing so, he clutched in a wears a thick, warm mane of hair. At the same time, however, a roar rang out in front of him, the gentle, protracted roar of a lion. The sign has come, said Zarathustra, and his heart was transformed. Here, he remembered the words of Prophet, and asked himself the last question. O Zarathustra, he said to me, I have come to seduce you, to your ultimate sin. To my ultimate sin? cried Zarathustra and laughed angrily, at his own words. What has been reserved for me, as my ultimate sin? And once more Zarathustra became absorbed in himself, and sat himself again on the great stone and meditated. Suddenly, he lipped up. Pity. Pity for the higher man. He cried out. And his countenance was transformed into brass. Very well. That has had its time. My suffering and my pity. What of them? For do I aspire after happiness? I aspire after my work. Very well. The lion has come. My children are near. Zarathustra has become ripe. My hour has come. This is my morning. My day begins. Rise up now. Rise up, great noontide. Thus spoke Zarathustra and left his cave. Glowing and strong, like a morning sun, emerging from behind dark mountains. Very well. That has had its time. My suffering and my pity. What of them? For do I aspire after happiness? I aspire after my work. Very well. The lion has come. My children are near. Zarathustra has become ripe. My hour has come. This is my morning. My day begins. Rise up now. Rise up, great noontide. Thus spoke Zarathustra and left his cave, glowing and strong, like a morning sun, emerging from behind dark mountains. This ending seems to be directly connected with Part 1, Zarathustra's Prologue, and Part 3, Old and New Law Tables. And, Eternal Recurrence Theory, was completely forgotten here. This is my conclusion. Something said to me as in a whisper, it is the stillest words which bring the storm. Thoughts that come on dove's feet guide the world. This is Niji's voice.